Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 93, Backward Mapping. Now, I'm only laughing a little bit because this feels a little bit sort of Monty Python and now for something completely different because I'm recording this vlog on January 1, 2018. I'm all alone on the campus. I have a desk, a chair, and a skull. So it feels a bit Python-esque, but thank you for joining me on this journey because I did want to record this vlog on January 1 because it's about new you, new year, new thesis. But I'm also introducing a trope, a theory, a paradigm, a strategy that could actually change your life and could actually change your thesis. And yes, that is backward mapping. So for our colleagues at Flinders, but also guys and girls doing PhDs in Australia, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and also in the United Kingdom where three-year PhDs are the archetype, are the norm, this is the strategy to get you to deliver that thesis in three years. For the guys and gals around the world who are in the North American models or in different nations in Europe where the models for completion and the time required to do a completion is different, this model can also be deployed the moment that your coursework and your mandatory requirements are over and you're hitting the thesis proper, you can use this strategy. So today this is a strategy of planning, planning for your PhD completion. And it's not only of use in a PhD and in research planning, indeed I would argue you cannot deliver high quality teaching and learning without an understanding of backward mapping. And indeed any project in life that you may create actually requires a sense of what is the output, what is the outcome, and how do I get there? So that is what we're going to talk about today. So this is a theory, a trope, and it's called backward mapping. It's also referred to as backward design. So after we've introduced the vlog this week with backward mapping, this is the first in a four-part series whoa, in January 2018, where we're then going to introduce a milestone system to you. So okay, we've got backward mapping, how do we do it? So the three vlogs that follow show you how to do it through the confirmation of candidature, the mid-candidature review, and also the end of thesis review. Now, as you can see, I mentioned the skull. I have a friend who's joining me through this series of four vlogs, and he has a name, like obviously, and his name is Hector. Now, Hector doesn't say a lot, but he is certainly a reminder of time passing and why time matters. Because let's face it, all of us end up like Hector, and the issue is what we do before we end up like Hector. And this is actually, can I say, Hector the second. I wish I was joking. This is the second skull in my life that has been named Hector. And again, it's not really my skull. My first skull was not really my skull. I shared it with my brother. Some of you may know I have a wonderful brother by the name of Stephen Brabazon. Big hi to Steve. He is 15 years older than me and he was enrolled in a medical degree. He's now a very famous, very wonderful uh, doctor in the southwest of Western Australia with a deep commitment to regional medicine. He's a legend. But of course, he was enrolled in his medical degree when I was a very little person and my mother wanted to help him study anatomy obviously, and so she obviously bought him a skull. And so there were all these bits of bones that were sort of around the house, like there were envelopes with phalanges in them and all sorts of stuff. And needless to say, Hector's skull moved round the house a fair amount. So he'd be sitting on our coffee table, sitting in someone's bedroom, and sort of, it felt right to sort of give him a name. So you'd walk into the lounge room, you go, hi Hector, how's it hanging? Now I often wonder, where that first Hector ended up, and I really don't know. But as you can see, I recently got a chance to buy a more stylized version of Hector. And the reason I wanted Hector to accompany us through this journey via backward mapping is because I think he's remi a reminder of a deep truth, a deep truth that has a lot of resonance in my life. And in fact, actually, it is the guiding question of my life. It is a rhetorical question, but I think it leads us into backward mapping in both an intellectual and an emotional way. So the key question that's often triggered, I think, by Hector, and the key question I ask myself every single day, is how would you live your life differently if you knew the time and the date 
of your death. I'll ask that question again. How would you live your life differently if you knew the time and the date of your death? Well, of course, that question encourages backward mapping. Uh, here is the point of my death. Okay, boom. Here is the point of my death. How am I going to live my life before I get there? So that's backward mapping, and I think Hector will encourage us to think about the importance of time, of not letting that PhD get away from you, and focusing and finishing. So backward mapping is a theory, it's a strategy that's used by teachers to create learning experiences on the basis of determining learning goals. So when we start backward mapping, our first priority is to assemble overt and clear learning objectives. So what are we trying to achieve? What are we trying to learn? What skills do we want to gain? So when we are overt with those learning objectives, it means we can move backwards from those learning objectives and work out how to get there. So in primary and secondary education, these learning objectives, the backward mapping, is often linked with national curriculum or national standards. You hear that language a lot in nations around the world. And actually, this was a radical change, a radical rupture in teacher education. When I did my first subjects in teacher education, in fact, my first subjects were in the early 1990s, so 1991 and 1992, Teacher education was in a pretty weird space at that point because you spent all this time doing lesson plans. And I remember thinking at the time, I was a very young woman, I remember thinking, okay, well, I've got the lesson plan thing, but how does this single lesson link with the bigger objectives of knowledge, what we're actually trying to achieve here this year, this term at school? And backward mapping was introduced uh, really through the 1990s, but became big through the 2000s, so that teachers and learners would focus on the big ideas, the big objectives, the big learning goals, rather than just focusing on a specific lesson that may not go anywhere. So students were doing assignments, they were doing assessments for a reason, and that reason was backwardly mapped from the learning objective. Cool. So all of this requires backward mapping and it allows us to focus on goals rather than on the process. And of course, this is an ideal method to think about and think through a PhD and a PhD candidature. And indeed, of course, any research project. Because yes, process matters. Okay, yeah. So you've got ethics in place, you've got academic and research integrity in place, that's fine, that's process. But at the end of the day, what are you trying to achieve here? You are trying to produce a PhD. You know that great cliche? You have one job. You have one job. You have one job. You have one <laughs> accessible object. Your PhD. At Flinders, you don't even have an oral exam. So you're not even assessed orally on the research. You have one job to produce a thesis that is assessed by two international examiners to see if you are good enough, full stop. So your thesis is your learning outcome and your backward mapping has to start there. So you have a time limit. You have three years. We have a learning outcome, which is your thesis. Okay, that's what we're doing. We now need to backwardly map. So what do you need to do to produce a 70 to 100,000 word thesis in three years? That's your out output, that's your hectare. What do we have to do to get you there? And that is why we use milestones. We actually have three milestones in place. A confirmation of candidature in your first year, the mid-thesis review, in the midpoint and then your end of thesis review. So all of that enables you to backwardly map from your supervision, from your submission and yes, from your examination. So when backward mapping happens in schools, it is driven by the teachers and curriculum. So you have the national standards, the national curriculum, and the teacher backwardly maps to ensure that the learning outcomes are accessible. Okay, now for a PhD, it's different. 
that your backward mapping must be configured via a partnership between your supervisor and you, the student. Now, most of you know, I start meeting one in the first year, meeting one with my PhD students, backwardly mapping from a three year completion. So in that first meeting, I backwardly map the entire PhD. Okay, I do a diagnostic if the student has particular gaps, whether it be information literacy or software or hardware, we diagnose that week one and we're able to solve those problems quite quickly. So I aim to produce with my students three chapters in the first year. Now I've always said the way you finish a PhD in three years is to work hard in the first year. If you're slack in the first year, if you're sort of going, oh, isn't this nice, I'm in a PhD program. If you're slack in the first year, you are stuffed. You are stuffed. You're going to be playing catch up through the entirety of your candidature. So in that first meeting of your PhD, backwardly map for me. Start with the completion in three years and then break down your chapters. Then from the chapters, break down the work that's required in each chapter, okay? So the tasks, then put a time frame around the completion of each of those tasks. So there you go, that's backward mapping. So whether we're talking about primary school, whether we're talking about a PhD, backward mapping has particular characteristics that make it different in teaching and learning. The most important change is that a lot of attention, a lot of time is placed on planning. So planning time at the start is very different. And during that planning time, you are configuring learning objectives, your demonstration of learning, your summative and formative assessment, we'll talk about those phrases in a sec, and then your review of learning, so what have I done, that was my backward mapping, let's go again, let's do the planning and get us to the next stage. So as you can see, the milestones that we've implemented allow you to simplify backward mapping. If you have no teaching and learning qualifications, then we've configured the software for you via Rex, a research excellence app, so that you don't have to necessarily know the protocols of this. The the software will guide you through this process. So even if you don't know what formative or summative assessment is, the software will help you get there. So just to help you and explain this, with your milestones, you are asked for professional development. The reason we're asking you for your professional development is that's your formative assessment. And the publications, the seminars you deliver, that's your summative assessment. And the chapters that you've produced and finished, hopefully, are the demonstration of your learning. So backward mapping is important because it ensures that students are successful because they have clear goals. So for supervisors, for teachers, Backward mapping is incredibly useful because it renders learning predictable, rational and logical. So none of this relies on inspiration or accidents or surprises. Backward mapping is about coherence. It's about predictability. So the challenge with backward mapping in the doctoral space is that it is a teaching-led theory in student and in school-based education. But in the doctoral space, it is a partnership between the supervisor and the student. But the actual point is, of course, you as a student, you haven't done a PhD before. That's the actual point. <laughs> Your supervisors have finished a completion, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 PhD students. So what that means is we know what's going on. We can predict problems, we have proxies for all sorts of issues that may or may not happen. So we know what causes the lags or the barriers or the delays. But of course the issue for you is individual PhD students are the archetype of the individual study program. Your backward mapping is going to be radically different from every single one of your friends. So you may all be enrolled in a PhD program, but every single one of you will have different backward mapping. So while, say, in a grade four classroom, all the students pretty well move at the same pace, have the same assignments, the same exam, get the same type of rubric of grades. So in a PhD or doctoral space, the whole party is bespoke. It's customised. Therefore, your backward mapping must fit 
your project, your progress, your goals. Backward mapping is so useful for a PhD, I cannot tell you. Why? Because a PhD is so damn big. It's a big thing, right? And three years of your life, three years is an incredibly long time. So if you think about it, who you were three years ago, you were a radically different person to who you are now. So what I ask you to do to start the backward mapping is break down your thesis and your research into the readings required, the experiments, the field work, the archives that you might investigate. Get everything into bite size chunks for me. Now this is great, this is called, and I love this phrase, this is called chunking. Chunking is my verb of 2018. Are you chunking? How's your chunking going on? So it's all about saying, here's this big PhD, create a chunk that is doable, that you can put a time frame around it and you can finish it. So the way you finish a PhD is to chunk it, girlfriend, chunk it. So the final great strength of backward mapping is that it makes you and your supervisors think about the accessible item in a PhD. So how are you demonstrating and completing that thesis? How are you completing that work that the examiners are going to assess? So here is the goal that you need to reach for your PhD. How are you going to demonstrate that you have completed a PhD at quality? What evidence are you going to use on the way through to that completion to show that you are on schedule? So that, of course, is the meta point about backward mapping. It's a strategy of teaching and learning that also teaches you about teaching and learning. If you understand backward mapping, you will supervise the next generation of PhD students incredibly well. So you supervise through this continual iterative understanding of progress. The key change that exists in backward mapping is that right at the start, you think about the end. Right at the start, you think about the goals you're going to require to get to that ending. And you spend a lot of time in planning. It's often called forward loading. So right at the start, you load all the planning and the issues right at the start. It takes a bit of time, but then your entire schedule is in place. Backward mapping addresses the two major disasters that we all see in PhD candidatures. So the students that are not going to finish they have two characteristics. Firstly, they're simply purposeless. So they move through candidates and go, oh, isn't this great? I'm a PhD student. Not doing terribly much, not doing much. Oh, isn't this great? Fantastic. So they just sort of wander through and think that being enrolled on a PhD is having a lot of coffee. And yes, you have a lot of coffee, but there's other stuff you have to do as well. So backward mapping addresses that purposelessness. And also the second issue it addresses, that's the second characteristic of students that don't finish, is it addresses the generalised nature of the project. So some people come into a PhD, the thesis is way too big at the start, they can never, ever finish it. Too generalised, too vague. And that's where the best PhD supervisors, this is where a great supervisor makes a difference. So week one into a candidature, we can look at that project and go, dude, that thesis is too big, cut its legs off. And if you've got a good supervisor who can do that, that will save you two years of your life and you might actually finish. So as you can see, backward mapping gives you a purpose. It gives you a focus. It cuts away the extraneous bits of a project as early and as quickly as possible. So as we move through the milestones in the next three weeks, just remember the three stages of backward mapping. The first one, what's the result? What's the big outcome you want here? And the answer is our thesis. Backward mapping, start with the thesis, start with the end, start with Hector. Then, on the way through to that end point, what evidence are you going to use to demonstrate your progress? What are you going to demonstrate on the way through that you've got there? It's evidence driven. Okay. And the final point is, therefore, what activities and what actions are you going to undertake to create that evidence? So, the take-home message of backward mapping is begin at the end. Commence where you would like to finish. So on January 1, 2018, wow, I wish you love, 
light and peace. I think Hector's pretty impressed too. Let's have a good year, team. <laughs>